Hey folks, we still have friends coming in, and so if you would look to your left and right, and if you're not saving a seat, could we scoot in, get in community, get friendly so that other folks can sit, find a seat, especially if they're coming in as a group, they can sit together. This is about community, so we're gonna get cozy. Thank you. Where do you find belonging? Is it in the sun that lights the sky? Is it in the hallways that no one lies? Is it in the eyes of a loved one Is it in every step you take? Is it in the face of someone you know? Or someone you don't? Is it in the rocks that tumble? Or the puzzle pieces that fit together? Is it in the complete or in the incomplete? Or the warmth of home? Is it in the loud or is it in the quiet? Where do you find belonging? Hello, welcome, good evening, friends. Welcome to the eighth annual Diversity Monologues. Woo! That is the energy we're looking for tonight. So welcome to our friends and our family um, here in the Robinson Teaching Theater. And we also have friends watching on the live stream. So thank you to everyone for sharing this evening in joy and celebration to hear from our students. My name is Ayaka Dohi, and I have the privilege to serve as the Director for Student Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at Whitworth. <laughs> Diversity Monologues. Not the star, we have friends for that. Diversity Monologues is an annual event showcasing the stories of Whitworth University students. And tonight, eight Whitworth students will share how they come to know belonging through their family, friends, culture, media, education, and their diverse life experiences. Diversity Monologues aims to build a sense of community by uplifting the diverse experiences of our campus to highlight the value of human differences through stories and poetry, and to exercise our critical thinking and reflection in order to stimulate personal growth. The following eight poet scholars will be sharing a part of their story about how they come to know belonging, a feeling that many of us may think we know and understand, but the ways in which we experience it are vastly different based on our circumstance, positionality, context, and even how others in our society perceives us. This is the power of voice, of diversity monologues. What we thought or we think we know will be challenged 
or rather widened when we listen deeply to the story of others. And we become linked in this way. Relationships and community are built on knowing one another. There's a saying that once you hear someone's story, it becomes a part of you. What will you do with this incredible gift of receiving a story, a poem, or these monologues? I want to acknowledge the many members within our university that have shared their insights and energy to make diversity monologues a reality. The incredible staff in the Office of Student Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Lulu Gonzalez and Whit Jester. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Jess Clements and the consultants from the Writing Composition Commons who help prepare students by leading monologue writing workshops. The incredible team at University Events are leading the technical efforts here in the Robinson Teaching Theater. <laughs> Numerous staff and faculty supported by embedding the writing of a monologue or attendance at diversity monologues into their course syllabi, and others encourage students to submit monologues. A special shout out to our Diversity Monologues Planning Committee, um, and that includes Aurora Kamarashavu, Celia Hagee, and Kira Pratt. Yes. <laughs> Y'all, they spent countless hours meeting and planning and promoting this really special event, and I'm so grateful that we had the opportunity to lean on their wisdom and their dedication to this program. Um, a few more special thanks because there's, there are incredible people who are a part of this. Special thanks to Fevin Christensen who led our promotional work. If you saw it on social media, that was all Fevin. Mario Gonzalez who was our videographer and artistically brought these stories to life. And Quentin Sweat who created this year's Diversity Monologues book. So you probably have one on you, yes. Quentin thoughtfully included a meaningful symbol in our book this year. It is known as Vishuddha or the throat chakra. It is known as where you find your voice and speak your truth for yourself and others. This chakra is associated with speaking up and expressing yourself, but also hearing and being heard. All of these are elements of diversity monologues. We are appreciative of the support extended by the Whitworth community, including University President Dr. Scott McCulkin, and our program co-sponsors the U.S. Cultural Studies Program, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and a special thanks to our Student Life Vice President Rosetta Rhodes for being a leader on our campus. And last but not least, a former Whitworth colleague, David H. Garcia, for laying the groundwork for this life-changing program. Eight years later, and here we are still. Diversity Monologues demonstrates the collaborative nature of our community and the true engagement of our mission and education of mind and heart. All right, you're almost done with me. I am so excited to introduce our next speaker. Celia Hagee is a senior English major, a WCC consultant, and what is one of last year's Poet Scholars. Diversity monologues allowed my path to cross hers through her powerful writing and moving and powerful writing. This year, she has shared her time and leadership as one of the diversity monologue planning committee members. I invite Celia up to give the land acknowledgement. All right, welcome everyone. We acknowledge that we gather today on the traditional homelands of the four bands of the Spokane Tribe of Indians. Since time immemorial, the Spokane Tribe has lived in this land prosperously, identifying themselves as Skaleo, or flesh of the land. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and we acknowledge their continuing connection with the land, waters, and culture. We honor God with gratitude for the grant itself and the people who have fished, hunted, harvested, and gathered here for generations. This acknowledgement recognizes the first custodians of this land, 
the suffering they endured, and to the continued restoration and healing needed. It is important to understand the history that has brought us to reside here because such understanding fosters a more united community that honors and embraces the first peoples of Spokane. We thank the Spokane tribe members for sharing their stories, culture, and language to develop this welcome. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our next two speakers. Aurora Kamarashawi is a chemistry student here at Whitworth she has worked with me on the planning committee this spring, and we delivered monologues together at last year's showcase, and she'll be leading us in a prayer tonight. I am also grateful that University President Scott McQuilkin has joined us this evening. Dr. McQuilkin is a longtime Whitworth member, spanning his career from an undergraduate student, student athlete, faculty, coach, vice president of institutional advancement, and now serves as the 19th president of our university. So I now invite Aurora up to lead us in a prayer. Bow your head and join me in prayer. Lord, give us new strength so that we can build a place of belonging, to create a community for all to share who we are and our gift to know that each of us is loved, to help us see the light of Christ in all that we serve. Let us remember that each of us is loved, each of us is willed, and each of us is necessary. Let, let us learn from these experiences and allow our heart to receive these lessons and story openly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Ayaka, for those wonderful orienting words of introduction to this evening. Thank you, Celia, for reading the Land Acknowledgement Act, and Aurora, thank you for opening us in prayer. So it's my pleasure to also welcome you tonight to one of the most anticipated events of the year, the 2023 Diversity Monologues. It's been on the screen a bunch of times. This is the eighth time of hosting these events. So let me start by saying this. Among the very, very best things, very, very best things about my role as president is hearing about the stories of students. And that's more than just where you're from, what you're studying, your hopes and aspirations. Those are all interesting things. And I enjoy hearing about those. And I enjoy hearing about those things a lot. But it's the deeper aspects of your personal stories that are a privilege for me to hear and for Janice, who is here, to hear as well. What have been the experiences that have shaped you who are your influences and why? What have been the joys in your life? Where has the world and even our community been a difficult place to be? And of course, so much more. And so tonight is about storytelling. Stories speak to our most important experiences, thoughts, and reflections. Stories are a window into that which is most personal for us. Stories speak of our histories, the challenges, the triumphs, the pain, and the love. Stories weave us into our communities, and each one of us, there are the monologues we'll hear tonight, we may just see and hear something about ourselves. Some experience, some feeling, some aspect of tonight's presentation will likely resonate. Some aspect of a story that is a shared experience. Or perhaps a life story told offers a different perspective that's just so worthwhile to hear. And last, even as the stories help us to define community, they also speak to your uniqueness. No one in the room has the exact same story. So to the extent that any one story helps to bind us together, that will make us stronger. So thank you to the eight storytellers for your courage and generosity in sharing tonight and from what we will hear from you. May God bless you as you do that. And thanks for everyone in attendance tonight to be here to support our students as they tell their stories. God bless. Hello? Okay. Hi, everybody. 
Thank you for being here tonight, as so many people have said before me. Uh, my name is Whit Jester. I am the Bucksbridge Coordinator here at Whitworth, and I'm super excited to see you all here tonight. I have the great honor of introducing our artist in residence, Christian Page. Christian Page is an Emmy-nominated spoken word poet, a professional speaker, and an educator. Page has spoken to hundreds of thousands of people and loves to work with young people who are committed to doing good in the world. Paige is a first-generation college graduate, an Act 6 scholar, and is passionate about community, anti-racism, equity, and empowerment. He has spent his entire career in and around education, advocating for historically marginalized populations, and working to create equitable environments where young people can thrive. Paige's work has appeared on national stages, on television, and in museum exhibits. Paige is one of the top youth speakers in the Pacific Northwest and is demanded nationally. However, Paige believes there's no place like home. He was born and raised in Tacoma, Washington, where he currently lives and teaches. He believes that our voice is our most powerful tool and, encourage us to, and encourages us to use our voices to advocate, interrupt, empower, and teach. I've had the great joy of hanging out with Christian for um, the past few days, and he's just an outstanding person, and I'm thrilled you guys get to see a little bit of him tonight. Um, so without further ado, Christian Page. Ooh, good evening, y'all. This is the part where you say good evening back. I said good evening, y'all. Awesome, awesome. Man, it is, uh, it is so good to see this room full. Uh, reason being is because um, the folks who are going to be showcasing their stories with you tonight have worked hard. Um, they are also taking a tremendous amount of risk, right? And I would offer to you, right, in the work that we do as poets, as creators, as, as monologists, as people who, who come out to share our stories, is that there's always an opportunity, right, that it might not go the way that we imagined it in our heads. Um, it's a lot like our existence trying to be on campuses and spaces that were not built for us. Can I talk spicy to you all tonight? I just want to make sure. If you said no, right, there was not really a plan B, um, <laughs> right? But I, I want to be very clear and honest, right? Um, sometimes existing in these spaces as we're talking about belonging can be very difficult. And the reason being is because there are some places that have not yet learned how to love everyone. Ooh, if I can talk real spicy to you. Um, but the thing that I want folks to understand tonight, right, is that if you find yourself in a place or in spaces that have not yet learned how to love you, it does not mean that you are the problem. I just really want you all to hold that in your spirit tonight. Um, it looks like you already know what you're doing, but can I tell you what your jobs are tonight? You all came to the, the thing just thinking you were about to sit down for the entire, right? You can, you can still sit, it's cool, but you got a couple of jobs tonight, is that cool? Right, so here's your work. Um, some of you may have grown up in churches that look like the church that I went to. If someone talks to y'all tonight, will you talk back to them? Right, I'm just making sure. If you don't want to, I mean, it's early, you can still leave. Um, <laughs> The other thing I'll offer you is please don't leave people in here by themselves. If you hear something that resonates with you, it is okay to, mm. It's all right to snap along with them. It's all right to let them know that you see yourself and what it is that they're sharing, right? And I'm not telling you like, hey, me too, right? But <laughs> be with folks, right? And again, because this is a difficult thing to do. And here's the last of these things. Are you all prepared? Um, what you hear tonight please do not let it fall on deaf ears, right? When we talk about this idea of inclusion, if we talk about this idea of equity, if we talk about this sense of belonging, that game is a game of consistency, not a game of intensity. Do not let tonight be the only night where we, ce where we celebrate the voices of people who are not typically heard. If you hear stories tonight that resonate, if you feel compelled to take action, don't leave tonight here between seven and nine o'clock. You all know what I'm talking about. Can y'all commit to doing those things? If not, the exit sign is real red tonight. We're good? Y'all good? Y'all not finna leave nobody in here by themselves tonight? Fair, fair. Right, uh, in a poetry slam, we would call me the sack poet. <laughs> 
We'll see if you know what you're doing based on how you respond to my first piece. Is that fair? I'm going to give you all a grade at the end of the night, so be prepared. It will impact your GPA. Um, <laughs> I just want you all to know. So the first piece that I want to perform for you all uh, touches on the idea that I spoke about, right? Um, I grew up in the city of Tacoma. I heard a lot of cheers for Tacoma in the building come through, y'all. I see y'all. Come on, come on. Um, right? And when I found myself on a campus that looks a lot like yours, I was very clear that this was not made with me in mind. Right? The way that I pulled up, the way that I moved, the way that I spoke, my flowery socks, I think Jordan 1's are dress shoes. Right? Um, I, I'm very clear that that's not what happened. And I had to learn how to grow here anyway. The thing that I had to be reminded of is that there is a lot of people who have thrown dirt on top of seeds and forgot that they would grow to be trees. And so this first piece I want to perform for you all tonight, my Act 6 friends are a little bit tired of this one, but hmm, right? Uh, it's a poem that I wrote called Trees. So y'all practice your jobs tonight on me before I invite up our first poet scholar. Is that fair? All right. And the poem would read, they called us low income. They called us at risk. Always speaking from a deficit, didn't realize that my learned experience was prerequisite to be a leader in this community. How could you ever really know unity if you've never seen the broken? They tried to slam the door shut, but my elders held it open. See, they forgot to call us scholars. Forgot to call us knowledge dip sociologist, unapologist, polished with dreams of being our brother's keeper long before it was common in politics. See, we were the seeds that nobody expected to be trees, but we tend to supersede expectations, defy statistics, never standing complicit. See, leaders aren't just in our titles. It's synonymous with our existence. We were the roses that grew from the concrete, became the garden that grew from your ghetto, became the force that grew from the forgotten, proceeded without caution, never waited to blossom. See, this is the part of the story where somebody finally saw them and started grassroots. Humble beginnings in this early stage where teachers who cared worked extended days without extended pay just to see the students walk across that prestigious stage and not holding regular diploma. No, see, these were degrees for change. They gave us the tools, watered our seeds, never looked surprised at what their investment would bring. A network full of leaders from the hill to the CD, educated and ready to meet their city's needs, we changed campuses brought perspectives to private schools, navigated the unspoken rules of colleges that weren't built for us, with stories too unique for the common application, collected determination in a cadre and formation, we made an impact that could only be measured in scientific notation. Well, my math folks like that. <laughs> we became teachers, preachers, scientists, activists, lawyers, employers, nonprofit founders, and PhDs. But ultimately, when watered, we became trees. A wise person plants seeds to the descendants with no shade. The investment that was made receives returns every day. What started as little ripples has now become waves. And generational trajectories have been completely changed. Now, baby, this. <laughs> this is community development. And it doesn't start with tall buildings, renovations, or detaining our youth. This starts with homegrown leaders and afraid to speak their truth, able to bear fruit because they're connected with deep roots to a city that raised them and respects what they do. When a community stands together, then mountains become movable. Lights in a collective are too bright to be dimmed. See, we didn't love our cities because they were beautiful. Our cities are beautiful because we chose to love them. So don't call us anything that starts with a deficit. Call us scholars, call us leaders, call us change, call us trees. And discover what happens when you decide to water a seed, call us the future. <laughs> and watch us as we continue to bear fruit in what they told you was the desert. Peace. All right, all right, all right. So y'all ready to do your jobs tonight, it sounds like. Are you sure? Are you ready? 
All right, awesome. So I want to bring our first poet scholar up to the stage. We'll have Karis coming in to share a piece with us. My name is Karis Ann Gonzalez Yamsan, and I am from the Philippines. So for me, when I was thinking of how I came to find belonging and what belonging is, I got a lot of questions instead of an answer. And for me, I think belonging is a lifelong pursuit. It's something that is peaceful and it feels like home, but at the same time, it's fleeting. And so I haven't truly figured out the real meaning of belonging, but I believe that it is in those quiet, peaceful moments. I think that's belonging for me. How do you come to find belonging? How do I come to find belonging? You know, when I think about belonging, my mind drowns now with moments of comfort and joy and home, but with questions and anxious thoughts, I think to myself, where do I belong? Do I even belong? When I sit there laughing with women I adore in our deafening laughter, is this where I belong? When I finally feel compelled to share my deepest, darkest shame with a friend who I shared tears with, do I? finally belong, or in the chaos of the city where my peers enjoy the liberty of my spirit, the broadness of my perspective, the openness of my heart, is this where I belong? Maybe, maybe what it means to belong is to be in a clique with friends that look like me, talk like me, likes what I like, hates what I hate, or perhaps it's in a boy who I admire and admires me back, and in his eyes that sees both the horrible and the great, and yet my reflection remains unfathomably pure. Is this where my belonging is? When I think of where I fit in this vast passing world, shall I think of the place that birthed me? In the warmth by the beach with my sisters and my brother and my mother and my father, the place that I call home. Is this where I find the fulfillment of my belonging? Are the connections we make with friends, family, loved ones, enemies, acquaintances, passerbys, anyone and everyone, the source of our belonging? But when they eventually leave, or hurt, or lie to me, or realize that I no longer fit in the mold that they expect me to be, will I, will I lose? That belongingness I work so hard to keep, and what happens when they're gone? Tell me. When the friend that I have trusted eventually finds my company to be stale and disappears, will I lose my belonging? When the group that I laugh with, dance with, studied with, cried with, spent life with, eventually moves away and live new lives where I no longer exist, do I no longer have my belonging? And that boy <laughs> whose eyes that only ever looks at me shift towards another, will it crush the home that I thought I belonged in? And speaking of home, when the unspeakable, unthinkable, and yet unavoidable future that my beloved parents finally joins God, the home that birthed me, gone and no longer the place that I call home. Tell me now, where do I belong? Where do I belong? Do I even belong? Saan? 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 Okay. Perhaps, perhaps belonging is not in people, but within my passions, within me. When I speak in crowds, my heart pumping, my nerves screaming, shaking, breaking the insides of me, and yet I have peace. Or in a field where I'm running till exhaustion, experiencing the wins and the losses, the thrill of the game, maybe this, maybe this is belonging. 
But again, what happens when the moment passes? When I lose that indescribable piece that I believe to be belonging, will I go back to wandering and fitting in and wandering and fitting in, wandering, fitting in, wandering all over again? Is belongingness a lifelong pursuit to be received, experienced, and eventually lost? Will I always have to experience the great joy that came with it and suffer the inevitability of this changing temporary world? What if I get exhausted or fail to keep up or eventually lose hope? What then will become of life? Where will I belong? You know what they say? I'm quite social. I'm friendly. I kind of belong. I look like I belong. But then tell me, why can I touch the silence? Why can I embrace the solitude? I feel so alone within crowds, somehow always afraid that I will lose the ones I love. Where do I belong? Do I even belong? Saan ba ako nabibilang? Saan? 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 If this is belonging, do I even want it? To find a house but not a haven, who wants it? So what can I do now? Hmm? What can I do but look up into the heavens and plead to God, Father, keep me company. You called us to experience life with joy, but why do I feel loneliness even when I'm not alone? I'm somehow so scared to experience joy because it is a bargain and a bargain that I cannot afford. I hurt so well. I experience pain like it's a paid profession, so God, stay with me. Stay with me as I love and lose, as I treasure each passing moment, every spoken word, and all the places that I have called and will call home, every victory and loss in my belongingness and isolation, when I'm old and alone, I ask that I may remember it in my bones each time I felt that even for a moment, I felt like I belonged. Thank you. Y'all can keep the applause going. Please keep it going. Oh, all right, all right. I told you that your grade was on the way. Y'all are operating in like B minus territory right now, right? I don't know if y'all are real interested or if you're operating in C's get degrees, but um, we need y'all to turn this one up a little bit. Is that right? Awesome, awesome. Uh, so I'm going to ask um, our next performer to come to the stage, and I'm going to ask you all to give a round, uh, a warm round of applause for Brielle. My name is Brielle Dern. I'm from Sandpoint, Idaho. My monologue is called The Community, in quotations. And like, as someone that's part of the queer community, there's like, this weird kind of rift between like how you feel belonging within the queer community and then like kind of a lack of belonging within the greater community. And so a lot of it is kind of just um, talking about the difference between those two things. There is a rainbow sheep eating ice cream on my laptop. People don't usually see me staring at them as they stare at it. Did she just smile? Did he just wince? Mm, she definitely just rolled her eyes. Red flag. I tell myself at least this way I know where I belong, where I don't, where I don't want to, where I never could. Sometimes it's better to know than to know someone who doesn't really know you. My 63-year-old coworker and I really get along, but she still thinks my girlfriend 
is just a really, really good girl space friend. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if she would still ask me about her if she knew. I dilute the way I look when I'm out in the community, makeup on, piercings hidden, hand unheld, girl just friend, because if the wrong person thought that I was part of the community, I don't know that I could fight back. My sibling was forced out of the closet, forced into conversion therapy, and forced out of our home, and my mother still asks me why I didn't feel comfortable telling her about me. My parents love the sinner and hate the sin, all the while my guilty sinner of a self just wants to love. Maybe I do belong in hell, but this is sure as hell the first place I actually feel like I belong. At least I know I won't be hated for love. At least I know I'll be accepted. At least I know I'll be safe. At least I know I'll be happy. So if queer love is a sin, then please, by all means, put me with the sinners. You all care about your GPA right now. <laughs> Y'all give it up for Brielle one more time. Uh, my, my younger sister would say, um, it's giving B plus. Um, <laughs> while are operating well, um, I will ask you to keep that energy going as we invite up our next poet scholar, Dollar. Oh. I'm Dollar Ginu, and I'm South Sudanese, but currently live in Tacoma, Washington. My title is Am I Seen? It has that title just because I feel like belonging has to do with seeing one another. Uh, it's very similar with empathy. Like empathy you feel for one another, you see them as who they are. And I think that has a lot of components with belonging. And so I titled it Am I Seen? Um, almost kind of like a do I belong here, you know, because I can't belong if I'm not seen in a space. When asked the question, how do you come to know belonging, I thought to myself, this is easy to answer. But after further deliberation, I began to ask myself, well, in what situation? If you ask me about this institution, I have never belonged. C-O-M-M-U-N-I-T-Y, community. Community is made up of you and I. But how can I be in community when you do not see I? I am alone like the others of my skin tone. I have never belonged because I wasn't seen. Instead, others wanted to plaster my culture and those that look like me on themselves in an effort to see me. I can't belong in a space with blackface or where others get box braids and have a hip hop hooray because today they get to pretend to be black and tomorrow go back. I can't belong. I can't belong. In a space where others see slave every time they see a black person. I can't belong. In a space where non-black people use the N-word. I can't belong. In a space where you refer to me as an object when you use a lowercase b when referring to black people. I can't belong. Where you use the term blacks. I can't belong. 
in a space where black people are given clothes because you assume we can't afford any. I can't belong. In a space where I once wasn't welcomed, I mean, still am not welcomed. I can't belong. And I can go on and on, but perhaps I may be seen as in the wrong because I'm saying things that you have done or that make you feel uncomfortable. And before you hit me with the, well, that's not me. Reflect on how many times you've sat quietly while others have blatantly disrespected black individuals by using the N-word, any other slur, or by using a black scent. And I need you to remember that the B and I aren't included in the POC because unfortunately, as much as we've tried, some of you don't see us as equal or people. Now wait. This isn't a moment to get defensive and think of every time a black person did something wrong or an instance of black on black crime because remember, all other people groups have committed crimes against one another, yet a specific phrase hasn't been made. And remember, one black person doesn't speak for us all because we speak for ourselves. Now that it's established that we haven't and don't belong, how can we? Well, that's not up to me. I shouldn't be in charge of leading the movement of how I can make myself feel better in a space where you and the institution held up by white supremacy makes me feel uncomfortable. Therefore, I ask you, have you made others feel like they can belong in a space where it is easy to turn a blind eye because you feel comfortable? Do you even feel comfortable? Do you belong? And belonging doesn't mean supporting your friends when they need to be held accountable. And belonging doesn't mean just sending me an email about another dead black person. Enough of your thoughts and prayers followed by no action, no thoughts, and no prayers. I mean, making someone feel accepted, included, and a part of something. I mean, seeing me and not the part of me where you see yourself. I mean, the unapologetic me that calls you out. And if you haven't made someone feel like they can belong, now is the chance to start. As I don't want you to leave with a heavy heart, but with inspiration on how you can be a part of the movement of belonging. So, have you made a space where others belong? No, y'all keep that going. Don't stop on account of me. Yeah. Um, I want you to check in with your body for a quick second. And I think this is really important because I don't think that we do this enough, right? Check and see if your shoulders are closer to your earlobes than when they started at the beginning of the show. Check and see if your tongue is pressed against the top of your mouth a little bit harder <laughs> than we started this show. Can I, can I talk a little spicy to y'all? Check on your butt cheeks, right? <laughs> Are they clenched a little tight? Did you, get, <laughs> did you get uncomfortable, right, hearing somebody share a perspective of how they've walked on this campus? And if so, let's ask why. And I think this is a really important piece. Um, I hate that I got a follow dollar, y'all. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I was inspired. I recently did uh, Gonzaga University's, um, I know y'all about to fight me, it's cool. Um, recently did their, the diversity monologues. And there was a piece that really struck me by an individual there named RJ. 
Um, yeah, y'all tell RJ I said what's up. Uh, but I, I think it's really important for us to understand, right, that sometimes we don't understand the experience of other people, right? That universal perspective does not exist. And we don't get to tell other people about how they experience hurt. I, I wrote this piece um, inspired by RJ, and I wrote it about the day um, in which Tyree was killed. I don't know if you all are familiar, um, and I'm sad to say that Tyree wasn't the last body that I've watched um, be hurt, right? And like the expectation oftentimes is that black and brown bodies should just continue to move as if nothing happened. Right, and I would tell you if you've never had the experience of waking up and seeing yourself reflected, looped on the news, it feels a little bit wild. And so I wrote this piece about that particular space, about what that feels like, about what just a day in the life feels like waking up when that occurred. Can I read this piece to you all? Yeah. So the poem would read, wakes up hella black. Stretches one of them good stretches like Unc before he accepts the challenge to race them kids. Exits bed black, takes off bonnet or do rag or head scarf, lets locks remember who they were before being commanded to comply, checks Instagram. Does that thumb work out? Feeds that feed addiction. Realizes name in city trending, watches video, looks in mirror, sees reflection in both places, Tyree, George, Tamir, Botham, imagines who they were before being commanded to comply wonders, why internet censors language in the comment section but plays executions on a loop, alarm clock, be humble, sit down, be humble, sit down, plays loudly, again, through pocket-sized speakers, because I set 10 different alarms five minutes apart from each other because on days like this, I'd rather press snooze than be awake, devastated, dejected, dehumanized. Black boy experiences depression. Black boy hears black voice yell very loudly and his black head say depressed again. And I'll give you something to be depressed about, remembers that depression has never seemed to belong to us. That vulnerability is too expensive when the budget of your humanity is three-fifths of your counterparts. That mental health was mythology you weren't allowed to read, remember survival. Remembers resilient, remembers daddy, grandma, ancestors, resistance, dreams, ding. Black phone gets blue message. Sorry, Android friends. Group chat, white friend, did you see the video yet? Remembers video, remembers reflection, ignores text, puts on black armor, presents as fine, leaves house black, moves like magic, moves through the world, remembers world. Remember staff room, or classroom, or boardroom, remembers presentable, has to answer questions in a voice like this, like my mom used to when she would answer the phone, remembers rules that only seem to apply to you, remembers being the only one of you, majority always seems to remind you of minority finds myself, a gentrifying coffee shop, watches as barista makes micro foam matcha mocha mixed with almond milk blended with Monday's microaggression served, <laughs> from one performative ally to another, takes my coffee black, walks back black, minds black business, woman sees black body, clutches black purse, crosses black street, locks door at crosswalk, sees black as threatening, black boy looks in window, a shop he's likely to be followed in, sees reflection, remembers video, gets angry, like auntie, when she had to go down to them people's school because white teacher was acting like white lady on sidewalk checks Instagram. Feeds feed addiction. <laughs> Sees black boxes. Again. 
Group chat again, video again, angry again, anxious again, lights and sirens again, sight line on beeline to make sure I'm not the body that they're behind, paralyzed possibility, paralysis, probability, paranoia, breathes, remembers that Eric wasn't allowed to, remembers that I've done nothing wrong, remembers that sometimes that doesn't matter for Lando, tries to remember resilient before clocking into a job that will ask me to pretend that none of this ever happened, playing mental gymnastics with my mental health to keep from becoming Vesuvius all over the top of this curated paradise goes home, black, puts phone on airplane mode, people wondering why they can't reach me, Friends still sending links to video. Doesn't understand that I've already seen too many. Goes to sleep black. Sun rises again. Alarm clock rings. Be humble. Sit down. Be humble. Sit down. Be humble. Sit down. Be humble. I'd rather sleep in. Thank you. Thank you. Are y'all tired of me yet? Should I go home? No. Uh, I'm just making sure, right? Uh, yeah, I like being in Tacoma. Um, <laughs> I love y'all too, it's cool. Uh, can I perform a petty poem? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Do you all know what petty means? <laughs> right? Um, right, I'm letting y'all into like the inner cavities of my head in this conversation. Um, but I remember, like, as we talk about the sense of belonging, I remember very vividly the moment that I had to leave some of the places that I was in. Um, my grandmama told me, baby, she said, you better never stay in places that you know you've outgrown. Um, and the moment that I knew uh, that I had outgrown some of the spaces that I was in is that people forgot that I was beautiful. <laughs> uh, Y'all, I'm fine, right? Like. I'm <laughs> Let that be what it is. Uh, but I, and I don't mean that in the sense of like we would think about this as, as vanity. I mean it in the sense of like this is the way that God designed me. Um, that when my hair, before my hair was in locks, that it curled up toward the sun like trees do, like flowers do, right? Like nature was designed to do. And even though I know that I was beautiful, there were some people around me who couldn't quite understand <laughs> that that's what was going on. And so this is for my friends uh, who have decided to wear their hair natural, um, even though the world hasn't quite understood that we're beautiful the way that God has created us. Fair? All right. A poem would read. Ooh, y'all not gonna like this one. <laughs> my hair is a blue eye magnet, a composition of four C Cantu coils that consistently conjures confused compliments and common sense should tell you. But before you ask, no, you can't touch it. See, my deep conditioned consciousness complicates the common narrative, and I've concluded that most folks ain't used to this kind of beautiful. Not used to bounce being added to my bold. Not used to my free-flowing follicles following Frederick Douglass, abolishing your broken laws of professionalism. So you must not be used to seeing us like this. Not used to us acknowledging our roots while acknowledging our roots. Not used to seeing us locked up without being locked up. No, see, you're used to watching us cut ourselves down. Asking our sisters to relax so that you can feel comfortable asking us to taper and assimilate, fade and become second rate, stay in line and lay low and don't you go against the grain. But if you knew us, then you'd know that that's the formula for making waves because that's what we do, isn't it? Make the most out of most situations. Architects of the artful sense, alchemists of taking oppression and creating ascension. I guess that's why my hair always stood up. 
why it isn't afraid to take up space. Where my strands tangle themselves together in solidarity, it's in my DNA. Written in the fabric of my being, but it took me years to understand that this was a crown and that I was a king. See, my new growth became new growth, making me stand like I was eight inches taller, giving me strength like Samson, dodging Delilah's on the road to my queen, protecting my crown, not letting colonial fingers cause friction, because, baby, if you put raisins in your macaroni, you not allowed <laughs> in this kitchen. I'm unable to be compared. Foolish minds have fashioned my fro into comparable fiction. They say, do you know who you look like? And I respond with conviction. If it's not a revolutionary, then don't finish your sentence. I stand unbothered, unconcerned, unapologetic, and unfazed. I took a lesson from Toni Morrison and ignored the white gaze. See, I'll be black, bold, and beautiful for the rest of my days, wearing my crown out in public, celebrating the way that I was made. See, my new growth continues to bring new growth. Choosing to be me even if it splits ends, I remind myself that I'm royal. Pull up in your spot smelling like coconuts and castor oil with my, with my eco style aiding my ethos and style, I smile. When I realize the blue eyes making a beeline because this time I know they see me seeing myself as a king. And they better, baby, they better get used to seeing me like this. All right, all right, y'all. Uh, I'm gonna get out of your hair for a little bit. Do you all? All right. Uh, we're gonna invite up our next poet scholar, Anika. So my name's Anika. I actually grew up in Southern California. I'm in a small town called Hemet, and I recently moved up to Spokane when I was 17. I named the title of my monologue Good Enough because I've always struggled with feeling like I was good enough. When we were given the prompt of like, how do you come to find belonging? I took it kind of like a different approach, which was like, how do I find belonging within myself? I wrote a letter to myself for when I was 12 to like let myself know that like, you are good enough, you are worthy of people's time and like, it's gonna be okay, so. Is this on? Okay, cool. All right. Dear 12-year-old me, times are tough right now. I know. The harsh words your father uses against you and the yelling from your mother doesn't really help your anxiety too much. Your siblings' lives on your hands because you know that if you don't take care of them, then nobody else will. I know your parents aren't really getting along right now, and frankly, your father's training you to be a stay-at-home mother, which I know is something you don't want to be until you have a good career set in place. I know you have no clue who you are and what you want to be when you grow up, but it'll all be okay. I know your depression's kicking your butt right now, and you don't see anything past the age of 16. I know there's no hope, no drive, and I know you still, you don't feel good enough. Though, occasionally, even now, from your future self at age 19, you still don't feel good enough. We walk around this college campus and ask ourselves, do we really belong here? When we got a scholarship and were chosen from hundreds of others that applied, we still felt as if we didn't deserve it as if we were never good enough for that gift. They call it imposter syndrome. I know right now you have no clue what I'm talking about. College isn't even something you've considered a possibility for yourself. 
I know you feel as if the world is against you, and every step you do to try and climb out of that ditch you're in gets you deeper and deeper and deeper into feeling hopeless and like you don't belong. So dear 12-year-old me, you made it. <laughs> you made it past 16, you made it to college, you made it through your first semester, and it's going to be okay. It's a long journey, and at times you'll have people yell and scream at you that you'll end up just like the rest of your family, addicted to substances or pregnant as a kid. Other times, your mental health will creep up behind you and scare you back into the cycle of not feeling good enough or like you belong. And going through your first semester of college isn't easy either. Just because you made it to college doesn't mean those mental health issues went away. If anything, they were amplified. Walking onto a campus of a college where the student body does not resemble us, living on your own for the first time, and going to college when nobody else in your family has ever attended a university, it wasn't easy. Through your hardships, you were resilient, and though you haven't made a lot of friends, you found two who have really cared for you. They've become your family away from home. You may not see it now, but you thrive here. You make new friends and build stronger connections. You belong, and you should be proud of who you become. I love you. Keep being you. Sincerely, your future self. Y'all keep that going one more time. Oh. Oh, please, please. All right, all right. You all are getting to A minus territory, and I'm proud of you. Um, what I'll ask is that you keep the energy going for our next poet scholar coming to the stage, Logan. I'm Logan Bateman, I'm from Highlands Ranch, Colorado. My monologue is called Like Stones. I have done a lot of thinking about what it means to belong and how any of us belong. And I think the most apt metaphor to describe it is more like a stone than anything else. We like to think that we have places where we fit in like a puzzle piece, but I haven't found that to be super accurate. And I think we are more like stones tumbling down a river, shaping others and being shaped by others. You don't know me unless you've met me between the hours of one and three in the morning. <laughs> Two of my friends have met me here in my life more than anyone else. Ben, who I met in first grade, and Daniel, who I met in kindergarten. Through high school, we would stay up until the late hours of the morning talking about life and what we thought mattered, trying to find some sense of purpose in this world that so often just seems like rote daily rhythms. Those many nights spent breaking curfew, staring into the depths of a universe that feels so apathetically silent, trying to see some reflection of ourselves in the stars, and finally, sneaking back home into a dark house with a little shit of a dog who would bark his head off at the slightest <laughs> movement. Those nights filled me with so much life. And when I'm with those friends, I feel like a missing puzzle piece being snatched from under a couch and completing the picture. Opposite of those late nights with friends were many times where I would go unheard. See, I am by nature an observer. My mom had to learn that when you ask me a question, I'm not ignoring you, I just have to think through every possible answer to the thing you just asked me, why you asked me that, figure out the intention of what's going on there, and then maybe have the right answer, I don't know. She asked me a lot of questions. I didn't have a lot of answers. So people talk over me. 
and steering a conversation is a skill I still haven't developed. I sit and wait for conversation to die down before I say anything so that I know I'll be heard. And so the important things I have to say often go unheard. I learned that to belong, you have to shape yourself to fit the mold that others expect you to be in so they don't walk away before you've had a chance to say a word. Silent but thoughtful may be on my tombstone. <laughs> to belong, you must remain unseen. No, you must allow others to see you how they want to until you can land back at home with the friends who would listen. I knew if I could just write out the times I was ignored, my friends would be waiting right on the other side, ready to listen. And I came to Whitworth not expecting to instantly make those kinds of friends, but I was looking for the foundations of that kind of lifelong home. And I didn't find it anywhere, despite many, many attempts to find that place where my puzzle piece fit in, something just felt off. I didn't fit. I don't fit. And so I went home last summer ready to be at home with my friends where something made sense again, and Ben and Daniel felt as distant from me as everyone here did. It shattered me. Clearly, we are not puzzle pieces. And my best observations can only point to time and distance being the thing that is eroding a friendship that has endured for years. We are nothing but stones tumbling down a river. We'd like to think we come into this world designed to end up somewhere, but we are not cut out of cardboard destined to end up in a certain picture. We are stones being battered and cut by merely existing. Do any of us belong? Are any of us okay with who we are, with what we think we're going to achieve, or do we just find solace and distraction in everything we surround ourselves with? Isn't what we surround ourselves with all we really have? A river is never the same twice, so just get swept up and lost in it. No tree's roots are deep enough to withstand the current of time. And still, there's this stubborn voice in my head that I can't silence no matter how hard I've tried. And on depressive nights, I have tried. And it reminds me, we may just be stones careening down whatever the hell this life is, but we are stones being shaped by and shaping each other. Each interaction we have with someone else is a collision that permanently impacts who we are. The river smooths us out, and when we get through the rapids, we will settle into the bank with others who fit us just as we fit them, if we are willing to engage. It is life's greatest blessing to get to share in the presence of another, even if for just a short moment. So if you're like me, for God's sake, swallow your pride. Being someone who is calculated, filtered, and controlled is safe, yes, but that safety just isolates you. Growing up, I learned there were places where I would belong and places where I wouldn't. And to get through those times when I was unheard, I just had to get back to those friends where I belonged. The pain of taking too long to form words could be remedied by those that listened. But that idea has been the disease root fueling so much of the emptiness I've felt throughout my life because I default to projecting that silent but thoughtful stone. You can see whoever you want in me. And yet there are people here in this room who have been willing to sit with me in the storms that I've missed because I defaulted to being overlooked. How can I complain about being unseen if I've given people nothing to see? Life is too short to live without risk. I'm not saying we should tell everyone everything, <laughs> but there are people near you ready to listen to your story and receive it with grace and with kindness. But you will not belong with these people unless you allow the very core of your being to collide with theirs. It's messy and perilous, but it's the most meaningful thing we can do. To live is to get a chance at belonging, but that means to belong we must get a chance to live authentically, chaotically, and recklessly with other stones stuck on the same journey as us.
All right, you all keep it going one more time for Logan. Oh. It's feeling like an A in here. I'm really grateful for you all. Um, I want you to keep the same energy going for our next Poet Scholar, Sierra. I'm Sierra Polly, and I'm from Esau, Washington. Um, my monologue is titled The Battle of Belonging, Heart Versus Mind. My monologue was inspired a lot by the fears that I can sometimes have and like anxieties that my brain tells me, all of the what ifs. It kind of is wrapped up by my heart, like comforting me and saying like, no, you, you're loved and you matter and you belong here. of belonging. Have I ever felt this bliss? My gut wrenches momentarily as it battles between answering yes and no. My heart, optimistic in nature, says yes. She smiles with open arms, willing me to see what she sees. My brain, who has a difficult time letting go, says no. I see glimpses of all the times I was excluded, watching as pairs of friends buddy up being left behind, never chosen first. I feel the worry of being too much and not enough ripping away at my security. Hearing that pesky voice in my head say, you're not pretty enough, they'll never love you. You're too fat, they won't want you. You're not the right amount of anything to fit in anywhere. I feel the hurt of rejection and betrayal swirl into each other as I watch as friendship after friendship ends without an explanation of why, leaving me feeling helpless, questioning every interaction I had with these people before they cut all ties. Why? What did I do? I relive my first heartache to my last, stemming from crushes that never came to light. Crushes on people that taught me great things, but also crushes on people that blinded me from my own worth and my own power. My brain laughs while analyzing my zero in a million success rate with any infatuation I've had. Because clearly, she thinks, with the data previously stated, it must be proof of being unable to belong. Surely from some deficit of my own, I am unable to obtain the ability to find belonging. Dark isolation surrounds me and suffocates me. These hateful thoughts pull me further under like an anchor tied firmly to my ankle. Anxious thoughts whirl around me and begin their suffocating work. My arm shoots up above me toward the heavens, grasping for anything to pull me from my sorrows and my distresses. Submerged in the sea of despair, unable to breathe, overwhelmed by these anxious thoughts. I'm ready to accept them as truths. I'm prepared to let go of all hope when a hand, soft to the touch but firm in grip, grabs my own. Immediately I am filled with warmth and a steadiness never experienced before. I am effortlessly raised from the doom of my thoughts. Oxygen fills my lungs and hope rises in me once again. My heart greets me with the warmest smile. I see the people who encourage me to succeed and the support they give when I fall a bit too short. I see new friends and old friends grinning as their faces flash before my own. I even see my best friends coming to me and having conflict with me terrifying and difficult, but even then choosing to work on our friendship rather than run away. The people who see not only my good qualities, but my flaws as well, and still choose to love me. I see the love of my beautiful family, the unconditional love from the people who never let go of me. I see how they have put aside their preconceptions of the world to support the person I'm becoming, 
and the identities I have found within myself. I feel the love of a God who opens their arms to me, showing me that I was fearfully and wonderfully made, reminding me that I am never too much or too little, but perfectly imperfect, made in God's own image. My heart, wiser than my brain, says you mustn't forget the people who never left you. They are your lifeboat. Don't you see? You never once were at risk of not belonging. You had it all along. It's just that now the anxieties your brain presses upon you are quieter, and you can truly see just exactly how well you belong. All right, y'all keep that going. Give it up one more time. Um, man, has this been a great show so far? I thought I was the only one, so. Right, uh, how beautiful, how powerful it's been thus far. Um, can, I, can I switch gears for a quick second? Um, I think one of the most important things about my sense of belonging that most people don't get to see uh, is that I'm married to a superhuman. Um, my wife is an incredible human being. Um, oftentimes, uh, when I'm in spaces, um, people don't get to, to see her, they get to see me, when really she's the superpower behind all of this. Um, and some people will say something to the effect of, every time you see a strong man, there's a powerful woman behind him. But nah, there's a powerful woman in front of me and on the side of me and in front of me and, <laughs> right, like, um, and so, uh, can I be a lover boy for a quick second? Um, so these are, these are two poems uh, that are about love um, and about finding a sense of belonging in that. Um, one of them I wrote in high school. <laughs> And um, one of them, uh, I wrote when I was ready to marry uh, my girlfriend that then became my wife. Um, ooh, I feel mushy already, right? Ooh, ooh. Yeah, no, I'm feeling real Malik up here. Um, so, no, I love both of these pieces. Uh, yeah, you all give my high school self some love. Hold me, right? Uh, but no, these are two pieces that I think uh, really describe belonging in the way that I understand it. Uh, the best way that I felt it uh, is with, with my wife. So the first poem, uh, this is my high school poem. Are you ready? The poem would read, uh, If you didn't leave me lost for words, there's a million things that I could say. See, I could compliment your smile or I might ask about your day or I could get up the courage to finally come out and say that I hate it when you blink. Because that's one less second that I get to step into your eyes and I. I hope that when you think that all of your thoughts are similar to mine, because I'm thinking about you, I just hope that you're thinking about me. And how that space between your fingers is where mine is supposed to be, because I want to hold your hand everywhere for everyone to see and I. I want my boys to make fun of me so that I can be embarrassed. And I want you to take me home so that I can meet your parents. And I want someone to get on Facebook and record this and share this, because I could care less about a reputation if I had you to cherish. Because see, your beauty in its truest form with silk skin and the purest eyes, and you can't help but make me smile. With your elegant shape and beautiful style, every time that you come around, I just hope that you'd stay for a while. And if you didn't leave me lost for words, I would tell you that when you speak, the world around me stands still and only your voice matters and I get nervous and I butterflies and my heart starts to pattern. I get to forget my name and my thoughts get all scattered. I get to envy in any man that's ever left your heart shattered. Because see, I'd pick up the pieces and I'd put them back together in hopes that maybe one day you can get to know me better than my dream come true in me and you can be together because I feel like Prince Charming when I listen to the sweet syllables coming from Cinderella. So if the glass slipper fits and these feelings are real, then a prince and a princess should finally seal the deal. 
And we live happily ever after on a castle on a hill. And look back at this day when I told you how I feel. But until then, please keep leaving me lost for words. <laughs> Yo, can I tell y'all about my wife for a second? Um, so there's a line in there, right, like, and a prince and a princess. She's like, nah, boo, I'm the queen, um, right? <laughs> so uh, she's an amazing human. And right, like, the, the thing that I've, I, I've loved about this, right, is I've gotten to watch her um, grow from her high school years into the woman that she is now. Um, she's watched me do the same thing. And I love the, the ending of the piece of perfectly imperfect and understanding that. And the thing that has been the most beautiful is that me and my wife got it together, together, right? Um, and I think sometimes we have this idea that people are supposed to be perfect before we find ourselves in community with them. And I hope y'all know y'all ain't perfect. <laughs> um, but my grandmother would always tell me, she would read me um, the scripture that comes from Proverbs 31. And my, my, my grandmother is a beautiful southern woman from Louisiana, and she would go, baby, <laughs> you need to find you one of these. <laughs> and I remember the moment when I knew that that was my wife. Um, and so this is, this is the poem um, that I performed when I knew, right? It was not in February. Some of y'all got ring before spring energy, but I'm a chill, um, <laughs> right? Uh, I wrote this poem. Uh, Honoring, honoring my grandmother, honoring my, my wife. And the poem would read, um, Proverbs 18 and 22 says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. And it seems like ever since I've been aware of myself that I've been looking for someone like you. I've been looking for a woman who can manipulate time. A woman who can make a clock on a wall stop when she walks into a room and a woman who makes it feel like forever from the time that she leaves until the time that she graces my presence again. I've been looking for a woman who could turn mere moments into monumental memories, a woman that would stick with me in my struggle and celebrate with me in my times of success. See, I've been looking for a woman who would make me forget all about Folgers. Cause she'd be the best part of me waking up, see. I've been looking for something beautiful, for something breathtaking. I've been trying to find a good thing. See, I've been looking for a woman who loves Jesus more than she loves me. A woman whose heart is so lost in God that I literally have to pry it out of his hands in order for me to have a chance to love her. When people see us, I want them to see Isaac, Rebecca, to see Jacob and Rachel, to see Boaz and Ruth. I want them to see me and her and her and me and God and the both of us because our marriage will be a trinity to be two people becoming one flesh under the most high and see most guys wouldn't tell her this but our physical relationship can wait because nothing worth having comes easy but when that time does come I will let her run her fingers ever so gently down my spine because even our nasty will be beautiful Just the way that God intended it to be. See, I've been trying to find a good thing. I've been looking for a woman who will make me better so I can stand with faith like Abraham holding the hands of Sarah as we answer the calling that God has placed on our lives. I want a woman who's not afraid of forever because she knows no obstacle is great enough to hold us if we walk through it together. I want a woman who can love me in my darkest days, make me stop the foolish games I play, and instead of learning how to love a million different women, I would learn how to love her in a million different ways. See, I've been... I've been looking for a woman that I could bring home to my mom that's full of love and wisdom like Proverbs and Psalms. A woman who can make me smile with actions so subtle that my fingers fit together like 10 pieces of the same puzzle. See, I've been looking for a woman that makes love feel brand new, baby. I've been looking for a woman who's exactly like you. I've been looking for a woman who knows that I'm the one. I've been looking for a woman whose parents could call me son. I've been looking for a woman who would make me get down on one knee. And when the time comes, I will ask this woman if she will marry me. And when I walk down that aisle, 
and seal my promise with the ring. I will look you, my bride, in the eyes and know that I, that I have found my good thing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if they don't talk about y'all like that, go away. Uh, <laughs> leave them. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, grateful. Grateful to be able to have the opportunity to share with you all. I want you all to keep the energy going as we invite my friend, uh, reporting live, uh, my friend Janet to the stage. <laughs> My name is Janet Beltrana Podaca, and I am from Nuevo Casas Grandes, Chihuahua, Mexico. I think that the title Wings to Fly kind of um, comes with belonging in the sense that I want more people to feel comfortable in knowing that mental health is real and amongst many of us. And I think that um, spoken word poetry allows you to express yourself in a very creative way um, that allows people to connect and, you know, a way that we may not be able to in person. And so that's kind of like my goal for this poem. <clears throat> a few years ago, I was diagnosed with anxiety and depression. Upon this finding, I laugh. How can I be depressed if I am always smiling? I asked my psychiatrist. Some people are good at hiding it, she said. See, it wasn't until they introduced themselves to me so loudly, beating on my chest like a drum, that my heartbeat recognized them. See, life as a person with anxiety and depression starts before the day even begins. It holds me at the door to make sure I turn the stove off, even though I couldn't even find the strength to make myself some breakfast today. My anxiety feels like a roller coaster put on reverse, stuck in the cycle of going down, stuck in the cycle of going down. It forces me to speak in lower cases because I don't want you to think that something is wrong when in fact everything is wrong, when in fact everything is wrong. It just has nothing to do with you. In conversations, it makes me tiptoe around the truth because saying things in the moment does not allow me to overthink, overthink about what I should say or how I should say it. Like, I'm not really sure what triggered me right now. And I'm sorry if it seems like I'm not paying attention. It's just that my sympathetic nervous system decided to activate its fight or flight response and I'm not really sure which one to pick right now. Like, locking myself in my room feels safer than the outside world because if I choose to fight, I don't want you to think that I am weird for looking around, smelling a candle burning my chest and rocking back and forth until I can grind myself back into our conversation. <sighs> I'm sorry. What were you saying? <sighs> because of them, I often question myself a little too much. I uninvite myself to things because I overthink the tone in which you asked. I separate myself. Because how can I feel like I belong? How can people with mental illnesses feel like they belong when the only time they speak about their mental health issues is with their therapist? See, according to medical experts, anxiety and depression are common mental health conditions associated with lacking a sense of belonging. Like it's more normal to speak about gun control than the number one cause of suicide. Or like unequal access to mental health care and treatment is why many of us have struggled in silence for so long. Like it's something that doesn't affect me and it's something that doesn't affect you. Or like the anxiety disorders aren't the most common mental health conditions in the U.S. And 300 million people worldwide don't experience depression. Like the top six causes are genetics, brain chemistry imbalance, poor nutrition, physical health conditions, drugs, and stress. But most people still think it's something that's just in your head or it's not that bad. Like struggling to breathe is not that bad. Or struggling to wake up is not that bad. For those of you who relate to this feeling, I hope you feel proud. For learning how to swim and the feeling of water overtaking your lungs. 
for learning to identify that beating on your chest and dancing to its rhythm. And somewhere along the way, I, I hope you stop blaming yourself for who you are. See, you are not damaged goods or a burden for others to carry. You are the strongest warrior in this battle within yourself. I know things are hard right now. And I know things feel like they will never end, but I promise you they are better days. And when that time comes, I, I hope the day you choose to cocoon yourself into bed, turn you into a beautiful butterfly, giving you the wings you need to fly another day. Gracias. Y'all not cheering loud enough for me. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. This is like a 97.5. Y'all still got some time. Y'all still got some time. Uh, and this would be your opportunity, right, to get over the top. This is like extra credit at the end of the semester or the quarter. You know what I'm talking about. Um, I want you all to give it up uh, for my friend Celia. <laughs> My name is Celia Vigil, and I'm from Spokane, Washington. You have to let yourself belong first. Oftentimes, like, the piece that clicks is you, like, giving yourself permission to be who you are. They say you have to be known to be loved, so I think letting yourself be known in, like, all your true colors is really critical to feeling like you belong somewhere and finding kind of your people. I had a job interview the other week. It was for a teaching job in Mexico after graduation. And in that interview, they asked me this question. They said, so you're a fourth generation Mexican American. That means the last people in your family to live in Mexico were your great grandparents. You wrote in your application that sometimes people in the United States treat you like a foreigner because of your ethnicity. If you get this job and come teach in Mexico, people will still treat you like a foreigner. What do you think of that? Four years ago, this question would have terrified me. It would have made me think I won't truly belong in either place. I don't belong anywhere. And when I started college, not belonging was my greatest fear. And every party, class, social gathering, club, I had one goal. And that was to be in, with the right crowd, with the cool people, with the group. Couldn't just be anywhere doing my thing. I had to be in the group. And the fear of not belonging ate away at me. I felt alienated sometimes with my white friends. Like I had to erase parts of myself to fit in, kind of fly under the radar and pretend like I was white. Because if they came into too much contact with the not white part of me, it would make them uncomfortable. And on the other side of things, I gotta be honest, I felt like a complete failure of a person of color because I was terrified people saw me as whitewashed. It felt like a scathing critique when another Hispanic person told me, you don't dress or talk like us, or you're saying it wrong, it's a tamal, not a tamale. Um, for the record, it really depends on where you live and who you talk to. <laughs> Oh, and of course, the always. Can you believe some people call themselves Latino but don't speak Spanish? Across a plethora of axes, I was trying to be everything to everyone. Don't make white people uncomfortable. When powerful professors say your name wrong, don't correct them too many times. Don't make men feel emasculated or be too smart for them. I actually, I have a confession. Um, when I was a freshman, I tried saying I was a peace studies major for a while, 
because I didn't want guys to feel intimidated or deterred by me being a political science major. <laughs> yeah, that was rough. Um, God forbid, like, anyone think I was opinionated or passionate or ambitious. All those adjectives that become a lot worse when you put them in front of the word woman. Besides, opinionated, passionate, ambitious, that's like the opposite of chill and cool. I tried every day of freshman year to look cute because Ruth Bader Ginsburg never went on a repeat date her first semester of college. <laughs> um, and she was my role model. I also worried that I looked like I was trying too hard. I catered to the male gaze and intentionally didn't cater to the male gaze to be, you know, a good feminist. Um, yeah, that was pretty rough. <laughs> and I was really concerned about being left out of parties. Uh, that's the other part of the confession. I once strongly assured someone I didn't mind the smell of weed in their car, you guys, because I was like, I, I'm not uptight like that. Like, it is so cool with me. Which, <laughs> ironically, that amount of overcompensation was probably the most uptight thing I could have done. Like, I was so conscious that I'd choose between being a cool person of color or a chapel person of color. Um, and that there are major pros and cons to both. And I was convinced that I would lose all credibility as a person of color if I dated a white person. But then the pandemic happened. Spring of freshman year, we're all sent home and in a storage closet turned bedroom in a basement. I lamented that I had really failed at being anything or anyone, and I had half-formed friendships at best. I was spending way too much on social media, like most of y'all, um, looking at all these pictures of friend groups, and I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I didn't make it into any, not of any color or any shared interest or anything. But life moved on. Um, I was working full time at a McDonald's drive through and there was no more cool crowd to pine after there. So <laughs> I accepted my failure and uh, tried to get on with life. So at some point, I realized I hate curling my hair every day and stopped. And that political science club was actually really important to me, even though it was so uncool. And that my faith was important to me even though it risked pegging myself as a chapel person of color. And then I'm a Christian, with like a lot of caveats. I even started taking Spanish classes, even though I had to start in beginner Spanish. Yes. <laughs> and I learned that no one actually cares. Like there are a lot of Hispanic students in beginner Spanish. It's not that big of a deal. <laughs> um, I even spent a semester in Latin America where I occupied this strange space in which I was both a foreigner and reconnecting to my roots in other moments. I was an undercover American and a part of the Latin American diaspora. So when they asked me that question in my interview, I could answer it without fear. I learned that there is not a risk of being excommunicated by like all people of color everywhere for going to chapel or going to parties or dating a white person. And I learned that I really like wearing um, my mom's pair of Dansko clogs, which these have got to be like the most universally unsexy shoe <laughs> <laughs> to like everyone. Um, but you know what? I get a lot of compliments from middle-aged women, so fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> And I fell in love. I told this person all about my crazy future plans for law school, strongly implying that I would have to wait at least seven years to get married um, because of all my plans. And he said I would wait seven years. <laughs> Junior year at mariachi night, we performed with the Ola Club and he was my dance partner. <laughs> he was like a foot taller than everyone else there. Blonde, as white as can be. And it was great. Like, it's still one of my best memories, dancing the night away with all of my friends and Ola, and the two of us are married now. <laughs> thank you, thank you. 
I got married while in college, <laughs> and I'm still me. Look, there, there are no cool people. There is no group. There are no right people. There is no right way to be a woman or a Christian or a person of color or literally anything else. We judge ourselves by the same standards we judge others. You can't deny yourself belonging and be a welcoming person that lets other people belong. You can't hate yourself and be neutral to everyone else. Love and generosity aren't individual practices, but they encompass how we interact with everyone else in our whole world. What I believe that everyone else is trying their best and is worthy of belonging. And I believe that I'm trying my best and am worthy of belonging. I'm kinder to myself and everyone else around me. And for me, there isn't another way to live. Now I know that my belonging is rooted in this generous love and acceptance. I try to practice toward myself and those around me. And in my mother's words, go where you are loved. Go where you are accepted and celebrated. That's where you belong. Thank you. You did it. Huh? Come on, 100%. Y'all understood the assignment tonight. I'm proud of you. You all give it up one more time for all of our poet scholars. Um, I have enjoyed immensely hanging out with you all tonight. I hope that you all have enjoyed all of the stories that you've heard up until this point, but you all remember our third rule, right? That this isn't allowed to stay here from the hours of seven to nine. Um, I've been asked to, to close the show and this is um, my favorite poem. And I think it relates to me in the same way that it relates to you, even if you don't know yet. Um, how many of y'all, if you didn't know before you walked in here, you know now that like, the world's a little bit messed up? <laughs> yeah? Uh, can I have people over 30 and over close your eyes for a second? Um, <laughs> how many of you know adults before you mess some stuff up? Right? Yeah? Don't clap, dang! Right? That's crazy! Um, also, right, like, so you know that you may not have been the person to mess it up, but many of you know that a generation will come after you and you do have a responsibility to make it better. And I remember um, when this responsibility became very real to me, uh, it was actually the first time uh, that I heard my daughter's heartbeat. Um, and I'll tell you all, right, like I have always been involved in my community. Um, I've always found myself in some way or some shape, someone labeling me an activist uh, for caring about stuff. Conversation for another time, uh, right? But I want you all to know, right, that there were people who will come and experience this space after you, right? And even if you are in a space right now where people haven't learned to love you or love your perverse, your your. your uh, uh, excuse me, specific diversity characteristic or pathways haven't been blazed, that might mean that you're the trailblazer. What I would offer to you is I accepted the responsibility and I hope that tonight we can do the same. And the impetus and the catalyst for that, right, is again, hearing my daughter's heartbeat. I know that we did a land acknowledgement at the beginning of this, um, but one of my favorite pieces of indigenous knowledge uh, there's an individual by the name of Dr. Chelsea Craig, shout out uh, to my First, uh, First Nations folks in the room. Um, but she lives by the idea of the seventh generation. She says, the work that I do in this world should honor the seven generations of people who have come before me. And the work that I do now should make way for the seven generations of people who come after me. 
And I want you all to know that like every day you make legacy decisions, as do I. And my hope is that you can pinpoint somebody that you can name something that you understand that a generation will follow you and understand your responsibility to make something better even if you weren't the people who messed it up. Fair? Here's my last piece. Uh, it's named after my daughter. Her name is Zion Kekona Piliahi Ka'omoana Oke Kai Page. Uh, and this is my favorite poem. The poem would read, I remember asking for you. I remember whispering your name over the ends of my fingertips while I spoke to God. I remember hearing your heartbeat, playing it on repeat. Your bass lines and drum beats convinced me that you had already sat at the feet of your ancestors. You sounded like soul music, like a live band like the opening track to an album that I'd never heard, but it always been my favorite song. I'm just glad that you're an artist. I can tell by the hieroglyphs written on the sides of your mother's abdomen, only a fool would call them stretch marks. I call them stencils, giving you the ability to trace your existence back to your first home, the evidence of your first miracle, the mosaic of majestic maternity perfectly purposely providing you with certainty that your mother's body sat at the precipice of your eternity internally. I hope that you understand your brilliance, that resilience is written in the fabric of your being, that your bloodlines know the full spectrum between freedom and captivity and will only accept the former, have navigated uncharted waters, have taken disconnected islands and made them a nation, I can tell by your heartbeat, by how rapid and rhythmic that life flows through your body, that you have torch-bearing hands, shoulders built for a legacy, and a smile that can inject joy into decaying dreams, I can tell by your heartbeat that you will groove like your grandfather that you will hammer dance when the world tries to tell you to two-step, I can tell by your heartbeat, that you will love like your grandmothers, living perfectly at the intersection of honesty and agape, I can tell by your heartbeat, that your laughter will become the soundtrack to my favorite memories and I'll be ready for the days that your tears ask the whys of this broken world when your spirit just won't accept the reasonless no's. The first time that you challenge a false narrative shot in your direction, they will try to call you an activist. <laughs> I will tell them that you were just raised properly. <laughs> that you're accustomed to knowing the truth. Your genesis will bring me revelations. My mistakes will become our lessons. And when they try to tell us, the broken stories of black fathers, the naive narrative of absence. I will play them, your living drum patterns, and lay down my vocals to the tune of our rewritten narrative, baby. I will tell them that I remember asking for you, that I whispered your name over the ends of my fingertips, and your heartbeat is the evidence that God can make fatherhood sound like music. Thank you all. What a night, yeah? I hope your hearts feel fuller. I hope your sense of community is widened. And if you were like me sitting here, my heart felt pulled with every monologue. And that, I think, is that invitation that Christian mentioned. 
And that might be a feeling that the story is now with you. And so don't walk away the same person as you are when you walked in. Um, we're so grateful for the eight poet scholars and Christian for the courage, their voice, and for being the wonderfully wonderful people and magical people that they are. So I'm gonna invite them in just a little bit to come up and we're gonna give them some more love. With that said, um, we're really excited that to be able to share with you at this point what our next year's diversity monologue is going to be because the hope is that not only are you walking away here more connected to our community, inspired to act, but that you also might be inspired to share your story. And so I'm excited to share that next year's ninth diversity monologue theme is how you come to know healing. With that, so, okay. Always a little nervous how it's going to be received. With that said, um, the, Whit the Whitworth Composition Commons will be available for uh, what we're going to call Diversity Moss. I'm going to read to you their blurb and I'm going to share this with you. The Whitworth Composition Commons, your university writing center is sponsoring Diversity Monologues Week next week from Monday the 24th to the 30th. We are excited to help you brainstorm ideas for next year's Diversity Monologue. Um, we can help you understand the genre of monologue and can tell you the story you didn't even know you needed to tell. So come see us. Come see us as you work toward publishing, performing, or just getting to know yourself and your community a little better. So sign up for a free, uh, free consultation with a friendly peer writing consultant. And if you grabbed a book, you'll see a quarter flyer um, in, in, inserted inside. Um, simply go to the Whitworth, Whitworth's webpage and type WCC into the search bar. So I want to remind you that Diversity Monologues is more than just this showcase. In those books are other stories, other monologues that you can read and take home. So I hope that you do. All right. I want to invite up our eight poet scholars once again and Christian Page and the sh show them tons of love because they totally deserve it. That is, woo. That is the end of our program. Uh, make sure you say hi to our friends down here when you see them around campus and we wish you a wonderful and peaceful evening. <laughs>